This is the day that the Lord has made, so let us rejoice and be glad in it. Hello and welcome to the Pastor's Moment. Happy Friday. Merry Christmas. God bless you. I pray that you have a wonderful Christmas. And I just want to encourage you today on this Pastor's Moment uh, about change, change, change. What type of change do you need in your life? Every one of us can uh, take some type of change, can receive some type of change in our lives today because a lot of us have issues. Every last one of us, some more than others, we have issues because we're not perfect. A man born of a woman is a few days full of trouble and we all need help. We all need change. We all need some type of change. And we know without God, we can't do it. So we need God to change us. We need God to help change us. And then not only that, in our mindset, we have to have the mindset to change. Our mindset must be ready to change. And so um, today I want to talk about change. And uh, I'm going to read a little uh, opening about change. And then we're going to look at some scriptures about change. Christ calls sinners to change. It's in the Bible. John 8, 10 through 11. And when Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? And she said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Another question. Can I change myself without God's help? It's in the Bible. Jeremiah 13, 23. Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard change his spots? Then may you also do good who are accustomed to do evil. And so um, no, we can't change ourselves. No, God has to do the changing. However, we have to have the want to change. We got to have the want to change. God offers to change our filthy garments so he can clothe us with his robes. It's in the Bible, Zechariah 3, uh, verses 3 through 4. Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and was standing before the angel. Then he answered and spoke to those who stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, See. I have removed your iniquity from you, and I will clothe you with rich robes. That is a blessing. God can clothe us with rich robes, but we have to have the want to change, the mindset, the heart to change. Okay? So that means we must be done with sin, done with doing sinful things all the time. Because a lot of us um, love to stay in, um, I would say, commit uh, continual sin, habitual sin. And we love to sin over and over the same sin. And so though we're saved, it's, we still need to come out of our sin problems, okay? Malachi 3 and 6 says, I, the Lord, do not change. So you, the descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Israel's existence was due only to the Lord's unchanging character and the unswerving commitment to his covenant promise with the patriarchs in general and in particular. They may experience God's goodness again and be blessed if they repent. Malachi presents a powerful ch challenge to repent. And that's the thing. We got to challenge ourselves. Challenge yourself to repent daily because we should be repenting daily because we sin daily, whether knowingly or unknowingly. So the truth was God hasn't changed and neither have they. He was a righteous as he was as righteous as ever and they ex acted unrighteously. God is immutable. He never changes. He, but, but the thing about it, we change. God never changed. We change. The word of God never changes, but we change. And that's the thing. We change. Um, Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes 3 and 1. There is a time for everything, everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. So not only does God fix the standard and withhold our dispense satisfaction, but he also appoint seasons and times and there's a time for everything but there's always a time for change always a time for change i'm telling you don't wait too late to change your mind to change your heart about christ don't wait too late isaiah 43 19 see i am doing a new thing somebody say i am doing a new thing now it springs up do you not perceive it I am making a way in the wilderness, in the streams, in the wastelands. So deliverance of the nation, of a nation in the past, will pale into insignificance in comparison with the future deliverance the Lord will give his people. There is hope for deliverance today for you. If God could deliver a nation, he could deliver you. Let me say that again. If God could deliver a nation, which was the nation of Israel, he could deliver you. The Lord reminds Isaiah readers um, of his deliverance of their ancestors from Egypt. 
we have assurance of God's deliverance. The question is, do you want it? Do you want it? Do you seek uh, deliverance? Do you seek God for that? And uh, But we must do it. We must do it in order to be a better person, in order to be a better uh, Christian, a better believer, uh, a better husband, a better wife, a better parent, a better friend. We must seek God for deliverance of those problems, sin problems, those uh, things that are weighing us down. We must seek deliverance from that. And sometimes sin does uh, feel good. However, it's not good. It's, it's bad for you. And so we must come out of that and be delivered from that. Okay. Um, we have limitations. Limitations 3. Limitations 3, verses 21 through 23. Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. So God's mercies refers to God's gracious love. It is a comprehensive Hensive term that encompasses love, grace, mercy, goodness, forgiveness, truth, compassion, and faithfulness. Though the Israel people was experiencing judgment, uh, God's covenant, loving kindness was always present and his incredible faithfulness always endured so that Judah would not be destroyed forever. Even through our trials and our tribulations, our ad adversities that we face, the temptations that we face day to day, Life, God's mercy is with us at all times. That is amazing that God's grace and mercy dwells with us at all times. Even though we're going through hell, even though we're experiencing um, all this drama and turmoil and pain and heartache and sickness, God's um, mercy and grace is there with us to help us. Romans 12, 1 through 2. Romans 12, verses 1, verses 2. Um, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing or acceptable to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform. Do not be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve that God is God's will is his good, pleasing and perfect will. So. This is a call for help. This is a call for help. Uh, this is a call for help. The mercies of God, the gracious, extravagant, divine grace is Paul. He's expounding in the first 11 chapters, including God's love, righteous grace, uh, and the gift of faith because of Christ's ultimate sacrifice. The Old Testament sacrifices are no longer of any effect. Okay, for those, for those in Christ, the only acceptable worship is to offer themselves completely to the Lord, to give yourself totally to God. Under God's control, the believer's yet unredeemed body can and must be yielded to him as an instrument of righteousness. And then it talks about reasonable. Reasonable service is from the Greek up for logic. Reasonable means logic. In light of all the spiritual uh, riches, believers enjoy solely as the fruit of God's mercy. It logically follows that they owe God their highest form of service. Don't we owe God our highest form of service? I know I do. For delivering me, for turning my life around, I owe God everything. For dying on a cross, I owe him everything. Confirm, confirm means refers to assuming an outward expression that does not reflect what is um, really inside a kind of a masquerade or act. The words form implies that Paul readers uh, were already allowing this to happen happen and must stop. The church was already um, being attacked and, and really turning over and conforming to the worldly ways, to their old ways, the paganism and everything else that was going on. So this world is better, this um, world is better, better translated as this age. When it talks about this world, it talks about the age, this age. So this age that we're in now, the age that Paul was in, and this age today, which refers to the system of beliefs, values, or the spirit of the age at any time current in the world. To transform, it talk, when it says transform, that means in the Greek word from which the uh, English word is metamorphosis. Metamorphosis comes, it connotes 
a change in outward appearance, the change in our outward appearance. Matthew uses the same word to describe the transfiguration. Matthew 7 and two, 17 and 2, Matthew 17 and 2, just as Christ briefly and in a limited way displayed outwardly his inner divine nature and glory at the transfiguration, Christ should outwardly manifest their inner redeemed natures, not once, however, but daily, not once, however, but daily. Uh, renewing of your mind, uh, that kind of transformation can occur only as the Holy Spirit changes our thinking through uh, consistent study and meditation of Scripture. The renewed mind is one saturated with and controlled by the Word of God. And that is a renewed mind. When you study the Scriptures, it will help you. It would make you want to change because the Scriptures will cut you. It's like a two-edged sword. It would cut you up and make you feel convicted. 1 Corinthians 6 and 11, it reads that, and that is what some of you were, but you were washed and you were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the, the spirit of our God. And I love the other version that says, and so were some of you, so were some of you. You were once this, you were once that, um, and, but God has changed us because we came and he brought us into himself into christ we came into christ and now our life is changed so though not all christians have been guilty of all those particular sins every christian is equally an ex-sinner we all are ex-sinners um since christ came to save sinners some who used to have those patterns of sinful life were falling into those old sins again and needed reminding that if they went all the way back to live as they used to. They were not going to inherit eternal salvation because it would indicate that they never was saved from the beginning. Washed, washed refers to the new life through spiritual cleansing and re regeneration. Sanctified, sanctified, this results in new behavior, which a transform, which, which a transformed life uh, always produces a new pattern of obedience and holiness. Though not perfection, this is a new direction, okay? Though you're not perfect, this is a new direction that you're taking in Christ. It's a new direction. It's a new way to go. Instead of going uh, to the left, you go to the right. Instead of going to the right, you go to the left. So instead of going uh, towards sin, uh, being drawn by sin, no. You, you leave that alone and you change your life. You, you turn your back to sin and you walk towards Christ. You walk towards Christ. So justified, justified. This refers to a new standing before God in which the Christian is clothed in Christ's righteousness. In his death, the believer's uh, sins were put to his account and he suffered for them so that his righteousness might be put to an account so that we might be blessed for it by the spirit. The Holy Spirit is the agent. The Holy Spirit is the agent of salvation transformation. Okay, it's the agent of transformation. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a what? New creation. Old things have passed away and behold, all things have become new. Everything is new now, now that you're in Christ. So in Christ, these two words comprise a brief but most profound statement of the exhaustible significance of believer's redemption, which includes the following. Number one, the believer's security in Christ who bore in his body God's judgment against sin. Number two, the believer's acceptance in him, with whom God alone is well pleased. Number three, the believer's future uh, assurance in him, who is the resurrection to eternal life, and so um, guarantor of the believer's inheritance in heaven. Number four, the believer's participation in the divine nature of Christ's everlasting word. So, those are the four. And then it talks about new creation. This describes something that is created at a um, qualitatively new level of experience. It refers to regeneration or the new birth. It refers to regeneration or the new birth. So once you come into Christ, there's a new birth. There's a regeneration. There's a new birth. There's a new cycle. It's different. It's different. Your life should show different. Your acts, your acting, your, your actions, everything should show different. Your, your, the way you talk, the way you walk, everything is different now. It's new. And it's a process. It's a, it's a process that you go through. You don't change overnight. So this expression encompasses the Christian's forgiveness of sins paid for in Christ's substitutionary death. 
Old things pass away. After a person is regenerated, old values, systems, priorities, beliefs, loves, uh, and, and plans are gone. All that's gone. All that you used to do in the old world and your old life is gone. Evil and sin are still present, but the believer sees them in a new perspective. And they are no longer they no longer control him. They, are no, they, they no longer control him. Those evil things, those sinful things no longer control, control him. He have control over it. So all things are new in the case that this newness is a continuing condition of fact. The believer's new spiritual perception of everything is, is a constant reality for him. And he now lives for eternity. No temporal things. James identifies this transformation as the faith that produces works. 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17. All scripture, somebody say all scripture, given by the inspiration of God and the pro is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So all scripture is given by the inspiration of God. God literally breathed out on all scripture. He breathed out on all scripture. Sometimes God told the Bible writers that the exact words to say, but more often he used their minds, their vocabulary and experiences to produce his own perfect, infallible, inerrant word. So scripture is called the oracles of God. That's what scriptures are called, the oracles of God. Doctrine refers to the divine instruction or doctrinal um, content of both the Old Testament and the New Testament. The scripture provides the comprehensive and complete body of divine truth necessary for the life and God godliness. Reproof, reproof refers to re the rebuke, the rebuke for wrong behavior and wrong belief. The scripture exposed this sin that can then be dealt with through confession and repentance. And I love reproof. I love talking about reproof. And that's what we're talking about today. Change, change, change. It's rebuke of the wrong behavior. Change. Correction. Correction refers to the restoration, the restoration of something to its proper condition. Scripture not only rebukes wrong behavior, but also points the way back to godly living. Scripture provides positive training instruction originally. Refer to training a child in godly behavior, not merely rebuke and correction of wrong behavior. Therefore, the word of God can totally and truly help change your heart, change your mind, change the status of your lifestyle and bring you to into Christ. And it does. It has for me and for several others and for those who are already in Christ, who are do, dealing with habitual sin. And we talked about that earlier at the beginning. God can deliver you from it, but you must meditate on his word both day and night. And not only that, you must also repent for your sins daily. James, our last one, James 1 and 17, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the he heavenly lights, who does not change like the shifting shadows. Christians are not to make the mistake of blaming God rather than themselves for the sin. Two different Greek words for the gift emphasize the perfect and inclusiveness of God's graciousness. The first denotes the act of giving, and the second is the object given. Okay? Everything related to the divine giving is adequate, complete, and beneficial. And beneficial. And I also have 2 Peter 3 and 9. I also have 2 Peter 3 and 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And I'm going to break this down because I don't want you to get the wrong understanding of this, because everybody is not going to be saved. That is called universalism. We do not be believe in universalism that everybody's going to heaven because we're already in hell. That's not true. God is not late. God is not slack. God is not late. Long suffering toward us is the saved people of God. He waits for them to be saved. God has an immense capacity of patience before he breaks forth in judgment. So God is still waiting. That's why he haven't, that's why Christ haven't came back for his church because he's still waiting for some people to come into Christ. There's still some people out there that need to come to Christ before he comes back and rapture the church. God endures endless blameless uh, blasphemies. See, God endures endless blasphemies against his name along with rebellion, rebellion, murders, and the ongoing breaking of his law waiting patiently while he is calling and redeeming his own and should perish and should perish. That means any must refer, uh, it must refer to those whom the Lord has chosen and will call to complete the redeemed. 
That's what he's waiting for. The church to be completed. The us, which is us, the saved. Uh, since the whole passage is about God's destroying the wicked, his patience is not so he can save all of them, but so that he can receive all to his own. He can't be waiting for everyone to be saved since the emphasis is that he will destroy the world in the ungodly. All should come, all should come to repentance is referring to us, all who are God's people, who will come to Christ to make up the full number of God, of the people of God. The reason for the delay in Christ coming and to attendant judgment is not because he is slow to keep his promise or because he wants to judge more of the wicked or because he is um, impotent in the face of wickedness. He delays his coming because he is patient and he desires the time for his people to repent. So that's what God is waiting. He's waiting for you to come to Christ. He's waiting for you to repent. He's waiting for you to change your mind, change your life. And he's waiting on you. He's waiting on you. God will do it. He will change your mind. He will change your attitude. He will change your heart. And I'm telling you, all you got to do is submit to Christ and seek God. Seek God daily. Seek him in his word. Seek him in prayer. Seek him in fasting. And God will come in. He will come into your life like never before. He will open the door. But he's waiting for you to knock because he's knocking at your door and he's waiting for you to open. So either or, he's waiting for you. He's waiting for you to accept the challenge. Accept the challenge and receive Christ in your heart. Accept the challenge if you're already a Christian to change your life, to get rid of those sin problems in those um, ugly ways and mean ways, selfish ways. I'm telling you, it's time for a change. I love you and I thank you once again. Merry Christmas and to God be the glory. For Truvine, we are the Church of Love. God bless.